1 Corinthians 14. Look at the last verse there. Here's the key to uh, this chapter here. Let all things be done decently and in order. Uh, I started a business meeting yesterday in Iola. Tried to be more casual. Didn't wear a jacket. Didn't live stream. It was like a family meeting. Uh, but I wanted to first start before we got the, the business meeting and say, really, every time we meet together as God's people, we're doing business, right? Doing the Father's business. And, and even the pastor's job to feed the flock, that's the business that I'm called to do. And So every time we meet together in God's house, God's people meeting together, uh, we're doing business. And it says to do it decently and in order. And so I was just talking about some things that I felt like we needed to kind of cinch up and, and uh, work on as a church family in Iola um, in regards to making sure things are done decently in order. Um, you, know, you know, there's just some different things that go on there uh, from time to time that I kind of forget about or I don't address that if a, if a visitor walks in, it might be something that would turn them away or cause them to say, hey, there's just no order in there or something. You know, obviously in the context here, if somebody walked in and everybody's speaking different languages, that's not order. <laughs> That's not order. If somebody walked in and it's like, who's in charge here? Everybody's just speaking their own mind and, and there's like no leadership. It's just kind of same way. There's no order there. You know, somebody comes into a, a business meeting and I was telling the folks there, I've been in a lot of churches. Praise the Lord. We don't have this issue right now, but I've been in some uh, church in some churches where the business meeting, everybody showed up. That was like the most attended service because everybody had something that they wanted to say. And this family would be fighting against this family. A lot of times the women would be the ones standing up most vocal, most irate. And it's just like, whoa, First Corinthians 14. I mean, <laughs> it's in there for a reason. And somebody walks in and everybody's emotions are flying. Everybody's fighting and, and all that kind of stuff. That's certainly not in order. Uh, and I, I, I pointed out there where it says, in verse 34, let your let your women keep silent silence in the church. And I thought that was interesting. It's not yours, like, hey, they're slaves or their property or possessions or something like that. But it's saying, hey, that guy is in charge of his family. It's his responsibility, right, to make sure his family is in subjection. And so one of the things we talked about there, you know, is making sure that we're responsible for keeping the kids, you know, uh, listening and, and paying attention and all that stuff and, and making sure... Uh, that our our wives aren't aren't overstepping their bounds and what they say and, and anyway I don't want to re-preach that that also but you know I felt like sometimes we have to have that family type meeting and we looked at that at this passage of scripture and that and I th think it's really leads up to what I'm preaching tonight it's interesting I uh, I started uh, I knew I was going to be preaching this and so and so on Sunday morning. A lot of times for Sunday school in Iola, what I like to do is do a kind of a word study. And it's usually something that helps me in one of the messages in the, uh, in the week, uh, just kind of looking at all the times that the Bible uses a specific word, gathering from that a definition, you know, and comparing that to you know, a lot of times Webster's definition of it or whatever and seeing in the Bible where it, where it fits, sorting all that out. And so I had this idea of saying, uh, of, of where it says, Amen. Right, all the times that the Bible says Amen. That was our Sunday school lesson. How ironic that you know uh, we had a, a congressman that next day close the prayer for Congress, say Amen, and a woman. And real easily, if you were in that Sunday school lesson, you know that Amen is not <laughs> has no gender assigned to it. Which I know he probably knew that he was just trying to make this silly. Uh, silly statement. And, uh, and anyway, the thing that got me about that, you know, is way more important than the fact that he said a woman, which was just silly, is that he addressed that prayer to Brahma, yep. the Indian goddess or God, Brahma. And as clear as day, there's no getting behind that. But nobody's nobody's really bringing that up in all the ad, uh, articles and I mean ads and I mean what do you call it? Uh, uh, art, uh, <laughs> what am I looking for? Uh, when somebody writes something, what do you call that? Articles. articles thank you. And so the articles, <laughs> I was saying advertisements. Uh, all the articles that I'm reading, even preachers putting out that, and all they want to say is how abomination. He said, "Amen and a woman." Like what about the fact that he said? to the, you know, the God, monotheistic God, Brahma. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world? Nobody's like bothered by that. 
this is a United Methodist pastor, which doesn't surprise me after you <laughs> find out about that. Uh, but anyway, it's a, how did I get off on that? Okay, so because he said, amen, right? And so, you know, it's one of the things that uh, has been on my mind for a little while. And so what about amen? Well, I want to talk about specifically uh, Thursdays we're, we're dealing with, uh, you know, uh, going on this little mini series uh, old revisiting old IFB or old Baptist hobby horses. And one of the things that you'll find out there that people talk about the old IFB and they'll talk about, there's a lot of shouting that goes on and yelling and stuff like that. And so I kind of want to talk about, that. I didn't know exactly what to title it, but I think I'm just going to call it shouting Baptists, shouting Baptists, because I saw an article somebody had read or a question that was posted to, I don't know this website, it's called Quora. Anybody ever heard of that? Q U and Quora. I think it's a place where you just ask a question and people can randomly just like help you answer that question or whatever. Certified. <laughs> Are they actually certified? <laughs> and uh, anyway, somebody said, you know, what is a shouting Baptist? And I thought, well, that's an interesting article. So I read it. There are some interesting answers to that. Let me just give you a couple of things that I saw there. So he said, what is a shouting Baptist? And I thought, this must be what I'm talking about, about people being loud and this reputation uh, the older Baptists, particularly independent fundamental Baptist churches, have of being shouting Baptists. And here's what he said, uh, one of the answers. In the South, this is an independent Baptist tradition. I went to Bible college at Tabernacle Baptist Church. I don't know anything about the church. I'm just telling you what he wrote. And he gave a picture of that church. And it says, in Greenville, South Carolina... Uh, he says, Dr. So-and-so was the pastor. They were shouting Baptists. The men shout, hallelujah, amen, brother, etc. during the preaching. Sometimes when the spirit moves, the more active males members start running. I've never actually been in a church like that, but I've seen a lot of it online. And, and doing research for this, I saw some crazy stuff. <clears throat> said, I saw one man jump up from his seat run up the middle of the aisle across the front of the church, wheeling around uh, to run back down the aisle and slam full force into the wall. <laughs> then it says, no, by the way, I watched a video. The guy jumps into the baptistry <laughs> and baptized himself. I don't know what inspired him to do that, but uh, this is crazy stuff. And it says this uh, note. Let me see here. Okay. It says note. Women stay silent in these churches. They don't shout, dance, run, etc. They all wear dresses. <laughs> I don't know. They don't run a shout. They wear dresses. <laughs> they don't run a shout, etc. They all wear dresses. It is considered unseemly for a woman to shout out like the men. Okay. We see from our text uh, tonight where they get that. Okay. Illustration number two, uh, or answer number two. These churches are characterized by emotional rather than expository preaching. The preacher breaks out into praises, rousing, country-style gospel music. Uh, and then he says, uh, let's see, Bob Jones University, which I don't really know anything about, okay? He shows a picture of that, is also in Greenville, South Carolina. They believe Christian music should not rouse anyone. I doubt that's true, <laughs> but anyway. Congregants should be silent during the service. No testimonies and no praises are allowed. Uh, naturally, Bob Jones University made fun of us when we were when we uh, uh, returned and we returned the favor. A premier shouting Baptist convention is on uh, Greer Baptist campgrounds, and it showed a picture of this uh, church here. It's a week-long camp meeting in Greer, South Carolina. All the spirit-filled church pastors take members for revival services. The congregants sleep and eat there in cabins like a summer camp. Evangelists known for passionate preaching and songs known uh, and songs known are invited for uh, tent style revival meetings. It is expected that people will be running, shouting, and jumping around. Note: These are anti tongue speaking Baptists. They will not tolerate it. <laughs> okay. Amen for that. But you know what's funny is that if you watch the service of some of these places, you would say. They might as well be speaking in tongues because they got something just in control of them and they're running around like, you know, there's no or decency or, or order there for sure. Okay. Uh, and then it says, okay, uh, I messed up. All that was the same guy writing that. Okay. This is the second answer. This guy says, usually independent fundamental Baptists are shouters. They shout, amen and hallelujah. 
It's probably they didn't say, hey, man. <laughs> hey, man. That's the churches I went to. Uh, anyway, although some IFB churches are about as quiet as Presbyterians. I suppose that's true. I don't know what Presbyterians do. Southern Baptists are generally very quiet as well. The thing about Baptist churches is that they are all so different and there are many different groups. And I appreciate that answer because that's very true. That's what it really comes down to is churches are different. Some are louder than others. I've been told if you go up in the north, like New England type churches, uh, probably a lot, of, a lot of people are more quiet. And if you go into southern churches, a lot of people are more shouting and stuff like that. Now, a lot of churches I've been in, not in the south, but, you know, here in Kansas or uh, maybe in Indiana, um, trying to think of some different places I've been to different churches, uh, not in the South, but heavily influenced by the South because a lot of the independent Baptist churches that were really strong in the South, you know, had a, they just had an influence. Maybe some schools or something, all the, ki all the kids went to that school and, uh, you know, they were taught to be like this and then they went to other churches. And there's a lot of shouting and what have you. Uh, and here's the truth. I believe that it's okay and right for churches to be different and to have some different characteristics. I don't have a problem going to a different church and being like, hey, that's not the way we do it. Uh, maybe somebody, uh, uh, you know, their dress at certain church will be a little more casual than another church. That's okay. I don't have a problem with that. I don't think that makes one church better than the other. Uh, primarily, if you go to a black church, primarily black folks, it's going to be different than if you go to a, a predominantly white church. That's just the way it is. And it's no, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, necessarily, but I'll say a lot of the videos that I watched that were really weird were black churches. <laughs> okay, but then again, I saw some guys in the South jumping around, jumping in the baptistry and sh and hollering and all that stuff as well. So it's just a cultural thing and uh, in different places you go to. Now, it's got to be decently and, decently and in order. So I don't care if it's, you know, cultural or this is the way we do it. If, if, if you're acting like wild and somebody could walk in and say, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, then I don't think that's right. You know, I don't think you should. Uh, it, and a lot of times what it comes down to is it's a show. They're putting on a show. They want to be seen over the pastor. And so sometimes, you know, the pastor will say something, and then you got people standing up, and they're shouting and hollering and all that stuff. It's, it's like I can't judge their motives, but it seems like what they're doing is they're trying to say, hey, amen me. <laughs> Look at me. You know, I want to put on a show. And so, uh, you know, jumping in the baptistry, come on. That's, they're trying to get attention. Right is what they're doing there, running around the aisle and then slamming into the wall. Uh, they're trying to get attention. So, but anyway, you can go to a church and it can be different, no problem. You go to one church and they're really leaning on the country, western feel, and the uh, southern gospel, maybe even bluegrass. I actually enjoy some bluegrass. I enjoy some of the country uh, influence singing. You go to another one, it's all old uh, traditional hymns. You know, uh, there's not a whole lot of new stuff. You go to others leaning more towards contemporary stuff. And I don't want to go that direction, but uh, but there are some people that are going a little bit in their music. We would think more contemporary, but that doesn't make them bad people or a bad church uh, by our standards. You know, uh, that's not, we're not, we're not the judges over that. And so, uh, you know, it's okay to have some different styles of dress. Some churches are very punctual, always start on time. Some churches, you never know when they're going to start. Come to Iola sometime, and that's <laughs> you'll see what I'm talking about. Again, cultural. There are certain places. You talk to missionaries, they'll go, you know, certain fields. They don't start hour, two hours after the time that they're supposed to meet. Um, it, those aren't necessarily bad things. I think it's okay. But there are some things that independent Baptist churches have and seem to have in common, certain characteristics as, as a whole. Or I should say they used to. Back uh, There was a day when pretty much any independent fundamental Baptist church you could expect to be uh, this way. A little more, I should say a little more modern. I don't know before like the 50s, I don't really know. But around the 50s, you could expect some certain things. Okay, One thing you would, you would expect to find is a very formal, conservative dress. Uh, dress. You know, they're always looking in, in a suit and all that. I mean, my, uh, my wife's grandpa... Uh, used to go fishing in a suit. <laughs> I'm not kidding. He would take a suit wherever he go. And I was like, what are you doing? You're not preaching or something like that. He said, well, how do I know someone's not going to call 
on the phone and I got to go make a call or go to the hospital or something like that. You know, I don't, I want to be prepared. And so he would go fishing. I said, I mean, he lived in suits. That was just the way that they used to do. And, uh, and I'm not saying that we got to do that. I'm just saying that was something like to find and not trendy. Hey, some churches today, they still wear suits, but they're like, uh, you know, pastel colors and like skinny, not jeans, but, you know, really tight suits and, and all this trendy, flashy stuff. Uh, that wasn't what you used to see. Most of the conservative churches, uh, Baptist churches, you know, stayed uh, as, away from the world. They didn't, they wanted to be distinctly different from the world. And so, you know, even though they're wearing suits and stuff, it might not look exactly like a modern day uh, businessman or whatever, then you'd expect to see conservative music mostly. Uh, like I said, a lot of times, Southern gospel, bluegrass, uh, things like that. And here's one thing I always noticed in the Baptist churches that I went to, mostly, obviously there's some exceptions, but mostly they all sang loud. And the preacher wanted it louder. He's like, come on, come on, sing up, sing up, get louder. And I remember thinking like, why is it so important that everybody's screaming, right? But that was the conservative way. And, uh, and, and, and so it was just this thing about being loud. I'm going to explain that a little bit more. But the services and the preaching was loud. And the preacher's yelling and hollering, and the people are shouting amen. That was like the ideal. If you weren't that way, you might have a guest speaker come, and I've had it happen before. A uh, guest speaker comes in, and they're preaching, and the people aren't doing that. They'll be like, what's wrong with you guys? Hey, how come? Hey, somebody say something. You know, how come you're not yelling? Get into it. You got acting like a bunch of Presbyterians and stuff like that. Like this, <laughs> right? And this was the kind of thing that they wanted lively services. A lot of times they'd have what's known. Have you ever heard the phrase uh, amen section? It'd be a group of guys. A lot of times it's like college kids or something like that. And uh, Or in overseas, we were in a church that was primarily, uh, we were in Japan, but it was primarily targeted people and so a lot of a lot of military folks were in there and i'm telling you there was a lot of shouting amen and and uh, and all and i remember th thinking about that and so i've been in different churches where there was an amen section you always knew coming out of that little corner over there they're gonna be hollering amen standing up sometimes waving their hands even or shouting you know uh sometimes you know people were like stylizing like they had their little thing that they did i remember one guy was always like wow Wow. And you just heard that like the whole sermon around. Wow. Wow. Somebody else is, hey, man. I mean, just like turning red in the face, just hollering, hey, man. And, and we actually had our pastor in uh, Southwest actually had to take a guy aside and say, you need to calm down because like people are paying more attention to you than they are me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, this but this was something that was kind of stereotypical of a lot of independent Baptist churches in that day. And there's still some old uh, IFB churches and and newer IFB churches that are like this, even some of the bigger churches. You know, like I mentioned, Southwest, about maybe 2,000 people. It's a lively church. There, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of yelling. I think things are decent, decently in an order, uh, but there is a lot of yelling. I've seen a lot of other churches that way as well. How many of y'all ever listen to, uh, i I, I got to be honest, I haven't listened to a whole lot of Jack Hiles in my life, uh, but have you ever heard a pre- uh, service where he's preaching and he's got a lot of young preacher boys like from the uh, Hiles Anderson College or something like that and they're in the service and it is loud when they start amen in and sometimes he has to tell them to cut it out because they won't stop you know amen <laughs> just for long periods of time hey that's just something that was kind of known at one point um, among independent fundamental Baptists and so revisiting these types of things that independent Baptists used to do now the Bible's our authority you know Preference isn't really the main thing that we're looking at. Uh, I, I, it doesn't really matter to me whether somebody is loud or not loud. I mean, there's a lot of things. When I'm visiting, revisiting these hobby horses, if you will, all I'm doing is saying, hey, there are some things that a lot of churches are getting away from. And it is interesting that he mentioned Presbyterians. Like, I don't really know. I've never been in a Presbyterian church. But I know this, that Reformed Baptists are pretty much Presbyterian. <laughs> right? If someone says Reformed Baptist. They're teaching a lot of the same things the Presbyterian church is. And so there's this more like, hey, we need to be real deep and we need to like, you know, discuss the these different th theologies and we need to go read from this guy and read from that guy. And so you can see where those types of churches have gotten away from that, those uncivilized Baptists, the, 
the holler and all that kind of stuff. No, we're more civilized than that. We drink beer and get tattoos and all that kind of stuff. Yes. <laughs> and so anyway, that's, that's kind of a joke. But anyway, I want to revisit some of these things and talk about why the yelling, why the shouting, is it right, when to do it, these kind of things. And so I want to just point out three different categories in a church service primarily that we're talking about where it can possibly get loud and what we want to do. What's the reason for lifting up our voice and uh, or being what's called shouting Baptists? Or should we be, you know, is the, is the idea. Okay, uh, first of all, the preaching. Okay, when we preach, a lot of times it gets loud. We'll look at some verses and talk about that. But the main point I want to make about preaching is this. We want to be sure when we preach that we're understood. And when you boil it all down, that's the main reason for lifting up your voice. <laughs> so that people understand you, that they're paying attention, that they're getting the message. Sometimes getting loud will get somebody's attention. You know, if you had a preacher that got up here and he's just like, da, 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 and everybody's just kind of droning off and then he says, hey! is going to get your attention. You're going to wake up, you're going to watch, right? And you want to make sure you're getting the attention. This is why some people do that. I remember being a Bible college student and I was sitting in chapels and I was watching some of the, what we call kind of like, you know, well-known pastors, the ones that they're going to get invited to speak at all these churches because they keep people's attention. That's what it really came down to. And I remember in one of my Bibles, I don't know if I still have that Bible or not, in the back, I would always write all these kind of, there was like an extra page for notes and I write all these things, you know, uh, down. And I remember, uh, this is like my first year of Bible college, and I was watching all these speakers and how they get people's attention. And I remember I was just saying, how to get, because I noticed anytime I had tried to preach, it was just like I didn't know what to do. Uh, nobody's listening to me, it felt like. And so I was like watching these guys trying to think, what are some things that they do? And, one, and in, right in my notes there, it says like, it's like move around a lot. Like you notice I moved over to this side, I'll move over to this side. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm coming to the side where people are falling asleep, but it helps if you see somebody kind of just getting warm and, and you walk up closer to them, they're probably going to pay attention. And then I also wrote clapping hands, right? Or snapping. I can't snap super loud, but sometimes you ever heard a preacher do that? Hey, and everybody stops and they look at that, right? Or they... Listen up now, it gets attention, right? These are things that get people's attention. And uh, they do that because they want what they're saying to be heard and to be understood. And if look, if a guy gets up here and he's preaching and he's just really not keeping anyone's attention, it could be a great sermon. It could be real deep. He could be pulling out some really good thoughts, but nobody's getting it. They're not understanding. So the first thing about preaching, we want uh, to be understood. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Okay, when we preach, we want to be, we want to exhort. We want to actually be getting through for people to hear. Whether we're preaching the gospel, same thing. You're preaching at the door, you learn how to preach the gospel. You want to make sure they're listening to you and they understand what you're saying. I mean, you might not want to turn red and scream at them and holler at them, but you know, you do want them to understand. Okay, so this is that's the key. All right, he that prophesieth, let me see, go to verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine, and even things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give the distinction in the sounds. Interesting, look up the distinction, and I noticed this uh, I'll save it for another time to study it further, but I noticed a, a similarity between divide. And you know how it says rightly dividing the church? Uh, I, I think we're going to read this from Nehemiah in a minute, but whenever he reads the Bible, it says, then he gave, uh, the dis he, he gave the distinction, I think is what it says. Right? In other words, he explained it to them. He, uh, 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 anyway, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that when we, get, when we look at Nehemiah. But he's saying... Uh, uh, whether a, a pipe or a harp, except they give a distinction in sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if a trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. 
That's what we don't want to do. We, won't, we don't want to just speak into the air. You know, now, let me just say this. Could a guy get up here and be speaking and raising his voice and clapping his hands, maybe putting on a show and everybody's watching, everybody's laughing, everybody's understanding, but at the end of the day, he's just speaking into the air? For sure. He's got to be making sense. He's got to be pointing people to the Bible and saying something of value, not just putting on a show or something like that. And so just because he's just because he's loud doesn't necessarily mean that he's communicating well either. All right, look at verse, uh, where do I leave off? Uh, uh, let's see, 10, thank you. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Uh, therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh, uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, if I, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so, ye, for as much as ye are zealous of the spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Uh, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, uh, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen? Understandeth not uh, what thou sayest. Uh, all these things, I kind of, I read ahead farther than I need to, but all these things are talk, exactly what I'm talking about in the, in the message tonight, about uh, making sure that the things that we say are understood and they have meaning and purpose and they're edifying. Idea, okay? And so uh, we do want to be understood. Look at Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. And look at verse 6. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass uh, withereth, and the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, bringeth good tidings. Get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. All right, look over at Isaiah 58. Your passage, you've probably heard this one before. Isaiah 58, verse 1 says, Cry aloud, voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions. In the house of Jacob, their look, if you're pointing somebody to the Lord, you know, you speak up. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid to point them to the Lord. If you're pointing out somebody's sins and you're condemning what they're doing and you're rebuking them, whatever, speak up. Don't be afraid to do that. And uh, and sometimes it, it's easy to get into the flesh and not want to do that. I do. A lot of times I'll preach something. And maybe it's a little bit hard to be received by some people. Then I'll apologize for it, right? Because I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to offend anybody or whatever. There's a time to apologize. Even the Apostle Paul, who was very straightforward in what he preached, sometimes would kind of apologize. Uh, and so we got to, you know, but for the most part, look, speak up. Make sure they understand what you're saying and that they understand this is the Word of God and, and where you got that from. Look at Ezekiel 6. Sometimes there's clapping of the hands and stomping of the feet. Ezekiel 6, 11. Thus saith the Lord God, smite with thine hand and stomp with thy foot and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Okay, so we see that their Bible gives us a lot of examples of preachers lifting up their voice and crying aloud. And, and, uh, and so that's certainly, there's certainly a reason to get loud. All right. 
But the main point is just that raising your voice, just to raise your voice doesn't do anything. You want to raise your voice to be understood. And actually, there's a time to be quite serious and maybe even lower the voice so that people understand what you're saying. And, uh, and this is the idea about the, the, our, our speaking and why it can get loud sometimes. <clears throat> Jesus often preached from a ship. Now, I don't know f- for sure about this, okay, but he often preached from a ship and he would just kind of go out, the multitudes there on the bank, And he would kind of go out a little ways from the shore and he would preach. Now, I guarantee he had to lift up his voice for one simple reason. If he didn't, nobody would hear him. (laughs) All right. So one reason that we have to lift up our voice is people can hear us. In this, uh, in this, uh, it's a small building, so it's not that big of a deal. But in uh, in Iola, it's not super huge either. But uh, in in Iola, I've got uh, speakers. I know I've got a lapel here so that in the live stream, I can be heard. But in this room, it's kind of dependent on me projecting my voice. And if somebody's in the, the baby room, the, the, I might have to be a little bit louder so that they can hear me, you know. And so uh, what I think happened, there's good evidence of this. Anybody ever been maybe camping or fishing uh, right off of the lake at night? Everything is still. And, man, you can hear the voice coming from the other side of the lake. And it sounds like they're standing right next to you because there's something about that water that just kind of projects the sound. And uh, there's ways to, uh, it used to be taught in, in preaching before microfo- before we had microphones. You know, a lot of the old preacher, you go to books back in the early 1900s and such where they would actually teach preachers how to project their voice and how to use their diaphragm and kind of like you're singing, you know what I mean? And save your voice. A lot of preachers, you know, if I had a voice where I actually was shouting a lot, uh, like some people do, and screaming and hollering, after a couple messages on Sunday, I would be gone. My voice would be shot. And I usually don't have that problem. Uh, sometimes if I'm singing and preaching, I get a little hoarse at the end of the day. I usually don't have that problem. But, you know, these preachers that shout a lot and they're yelling and all that, look, there's usually every year there's at least one time where they have a, a couple weeks where they have, like, no voice. Because they... <laughs> And they, because they've, they've just shouted, they don't have any voice left. So they used to teach people how to project their voice. And they used to teach them, like, if you're outside open air preaching, you're going to preach downwind. The, the wind is going to help carry your voice. You don't want to be preaching against that. Nobody's going to hear you. So you put the, the audience somewhere else. Sometimes lifting the voice is simple, so, simply so they can hear you. Now, if you're amplified, if you've got a microphone and you've got speakers, you might not necessarily have to worry about that uh, much. But sometimes the lifting up of the voice is just simply so they can be heard. Uh, Also, uh, yeah, I talked about open air preaching and what have you. And so let me just move on to the next point here. So the first thing is preaching. You go into an independent Baptist church. If somebody's never been to an independent Baptist church and they go to a traditional type church where this is a little more uh, of a common thing, they're going to hear a lot of preaching. And I've heard people say, it's just too loud. Uh, I knew a, a missionary, uh, long story, won't go into the details of who he is and everything, a uh, missionary who was saying, you know, he's in a more contemporary type church, probably not a lot of uh, lifting up the voice and yelling and all that stuff. And I remember he was talking about how, you know, he felt like it was really weird how a lot of these small Baptist churches, they got a lot of older folks and there's not a lot of people and the preacher would just get up there and he's yelling and he's yelling and he's yelling and he's, yelling and he's like, I don't like that. And look, there's a place for yelling, but I will say that there is also a time where it seems like over overkill. Like, what is the yell? Why are you yelling? Is it like, is it for the same reason that that guy that stands up and raises his hands and runs around the room, jumps in the baptistry, wants to be seen? You know, sometimes people will yell just so that they can be seen. We don't want to do that either. We want it to be useful, you know, edifying. It's, it's, there's for a reason. Okay, and so a lot of Baptist churches, you might be surprised at the volume not only of the preaching, but secondly, the amening. As I said, uh, there would be a lot of amens or preach it, you know, or uh, whatever. I think some of the weird things they say is a little over. <laughs> hey, man, <laughs> what is that? Where we went to that preacher's meeting and there was <laughs> there was a lot of that going on. Glory. <laughs> Glory. Uh, there was this thing, a kind of a trend that picked up. I'm not really trying to make fun of people necessarily, but there was a trend that kind of started where somebody would stand up and they would go, 
They wouldn't even say amen, but they would just do that. And then they would keep standing there. And it's like everybody in the whole congregation is no longer watching the preacher. They're watching that person that's standing there. And I guess they, they this is like, whoa, I can't help it. The Spirit just uh, got in me and I just got to praise the Lord. Okay, well, that's, that's fine. But make sure you're not just trying to draw the attention to yourself. You want to be edifying. You think the fact that everyone stopped listening to the preacher and they're now looking at you, your little glory session is edifying? No. <laughs> so we want to be careful that we're not being distracted. And I'm not telling anyone not to raise your hand or, you know, I guess if you stood up, uh, I wouldn't tell you to sit down. <laughs> but we want to be careful with that and make sure there's a meaning behind it. Because what happens, unfortunately, just like anything, you could get to a point where the main focus is on these little details or what we look like and not the message of why we're doing it. Clothing could be the same thing. Why do we dress a certain way? You know, types of songs. Why do we sing out of the songbook? Uh, if we have a reason for doing it and it's edifying, well, then great. But if we're just making this big devil, we got to do it this way because this is what all the churches did when I was growing up. And uh, look, that's not, that's not edifying to anybody. We need to know why we're doing it and we need to do things with a purpose. Okay, so what about the amening? Well, as I pointed out before, amen has it's not a gender okay amen. <laughs> not a gender you don't have to say a woman uh and even the word woman has the word man in it if you think about it but anyway <laughs> so uh, you don't have to uh, do that it just means truly or so be it or you're in agreement with what they're doing so uh preaching we want to be understood amening it's not so important that you're understood necessarily, but we want to be show that we're in agreement, right? That would be the main reason for amening or lifting up your voice in that way. Uh, and let me tell you a couple points about amening. Uh, I, I, I don't think that preachers should preach for amens, you know, hit certain topics just so that everybody will say amen. Now, that's kind of a uh, that's kind of a joke in a lot of independent Baptist churches I've been to is like, if you're not getting any amens, just say something, King James, and everybody, amen, <laughs> right? Because it's like pushing a pushing an amen buttons is what they used to call it, all right? And uh, there's there are lots of amen buttons, you know. Go to Romans 1, amen. <laughs> just, uh, there's a lot of amen buttons. You gotta, you, we can do that sometimes, fall into that crutch of like, I need someone to say amen. But uh, anyway, no, the idea is just that we are in agreement. We are in agreement. In fact, if you're amening just because of emotion, that's dangerous. Uh, I, I remember there was a song that we used to say. Okay, here's an example. There's, I, I got a few different cases uh, I could say, but uh, but there's a song Valerie used to sing, and she was saying, uh, let's see, uh, let me see, in their crystal balls and tea leaves, they find nothing helps or relieves all the loneliness inside, and you tell them about Jesus, and so few of them believe us, they just uh, they just turn and walk away, they say it matters not what. God you, you fear as long as you're sincere, we'll all reach heaven someday. And the way she plays that song, it, 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 it kind of crescendos on that last statement. It says, we'll all reach heaven someday. And I remember the first time she sang that, and I heard everyone say, amen. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. We're not all going to reach heaven someday. That's not the point of the song. The point is they all think we'll reach heaven someday. And then the chorus goes, but I say Calvary makes the difference. That's when you're supposed to say amen. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But sometimes people are just going into the emotion. They're not even really listening to what you're saying. They're just like, hey, this is a good time to say amen. And they say amen. That kind of shows that they're not really trying to help be edifying, but they're just trying to, uh, you know, uh, just find an opportunity to do that. Now, I'll say this. There are a couple other benefits of saying amen. Saying amen do you know one thing it does actually helps you, the person that's saying amen, I mean, to, to pay attention? I remember discovering this as a kid who oftentimes, admittedly, fell asleep during the preaching. It didn't matter who was preaching, how good of a preacher they were, I'd fall asleep because that's just uh, it was just something I did if I was sitting still. But here's what I found. If I look for opportunities to say amen, it helped me stay awake <laughs> because I'm like, okay, when am I going to say amen? You're right. And you say, oh, hey, amen. I, I mean, I'm not... You want to be edifying to people. That's your main reason for saying amen. But do you understand how that even keeps you awake? Say amen. <laughs> no, seriously, say amen. <laughs> it keeps you awake. You're looking for an opportunity, you know. And sometimes preachers will do that. Hey, can I get an amen, you know, or something like that. And it makes everybody say amen. Now they're focused on the attention. That's a benefit of being, saying amen or praise the Lord or whatever. Another benefit is it helps keep other people awake. That's another thing I discovered as a kid. 
I'd be falling asleep, and then the guy next to me would say, hey, "Amen," and I would wake up. Well, something's good. Something's good being preached. I mean, I, you know, I need to pay attention. All right. So there are other benefits of saying "Amen" and being loud. But the thing is, we just don't want to get to a point uh, where, and we, we don't have this problem here, but I'm just saying we don't want to get to the point where it's distracting, and it's just all about, you know. If you get a visitor come in and they're just like, well, I've never been in a church where people are yelling like that. It could be a turnoff to them, you know, unless it's edifying because amen can be edifying. Hearing people actually listening to the preacher and agreeing with them and being excited and, uh, and showing that excitement, that could be a, bl a blessing to somebody that, that comes into the service. And I'll tell you this, another thing is that it is encouraging to the preacher to hear amen that know that people are in agreement, at least nodding the head and making eye contact or something like that. <laughs> Uh, because, I mean, it's not your fault necessarily. You've been working along or whatever, then you come in Sunday morning or whatever, and, and it might be kind of hard to follow along. But, uh, but look, the preacher, if he doesn't feel like people are tuning in, it's just hard for him to get excited. So sometimes showing that you're in agreement even helps the preacher. So these are some reasons for saying amen. We want to show that we are in agreement. The congregation uh, wants to be in agreement. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8. So this is the verse I was talking about. Nehemiah chapter 8. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was uh, before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women, and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, uh, which they had made for, this pur for the purpose. And beside him stood Mat uh, Mattathiah, and Sema, and Aniah, and Uri Urijah, and Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and on his left hand, Padiah and Mishael and Melchiah and Hashem and Hashbadana, Zechariah and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened the book, the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worship the Lord with their faces uh, to the ground. So you see there where the whole assembly was in agreement with what was being said. And, uh, and they, and they worshiped the Lord. They were in agreement with the word they said. They all in agreement said, amen, amen. Let it be so. We agree, whatever, you know, uh, how, what that means. And then they bowed uh, to the Lord. And it was in this passage, I think the point I was making earlier is that he also says, uh, that they gave the uh, they gave the sense. Did I read that part? It says that he gave the sense, and uh, it's not important to the message, but I'm just curious about that now. And anyway, I have to look at that. As a, that'll be another message, okay? <laughs> so anyway, but notice this from that text. This has always stuck out of me in this passage. Who all was present in that assembly? Women, men, all that could understand. And it says the whole congregation said amen. I personally have no problem with women saying amen. Now, if a woman got up and was shouting and saying amen, there'd be something wrong with that. Okay, that's not decent in order. How do you know that? 1 Corinthians 14, let's go there. Look at verse 34. Let your women keep silent in the church, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. 
Now, that could be offensive nowadays, but look, that's in the Bible, and it's in the Bible for a reason. And so, look, it is inappropriate, like that guy said. I don't know if he was making fun or whatever, but he said, uh, uh, let's see, he said the women, he said the women stay silent in these churches. They don't shout, dance, run, etc. They all wear dresses, amen. <laughs> it is considered unseemly for a woman to shout out like the men. I agree with that. I don't think women should, like be up there and just being real loud. They certainly should never be in an argument or like bringing some kind of new idea or, uh, or teaching to the table or whatever. The Bible said, let the men take care of that. Now, can some women handle the word of God very well? Yes, but that's not the point. The point is God wanted there to be a structure and a leadership, and there's a whole lot that the Bible says about that, but he wanted the men to be in charge, so women have to allow for the men to be in charge. And quite honestly, I believe most women, though, though some would uh, deny this, most women want men to be in charge. They want the man to be a strong man who's a leader and he's in charge. And so uh, they don't really want the women just standing up and make, taking care of all the things and, and the businesses and, and taking charge while the men are just sitting there like this. They really don't like it. It's not attractive. <laughs> okay, It's manly to be able to, uh, uh, to speak up. It is not feminine, however. Okay, And the Bible says a lot about that. Ladies are supposed to be, uh, have a quiet and meek spirit. All right. Finally, uh, lifting up the voice. Why uh, some? Cases where it gets loud in, in the church, shouting Baptist churches is singing, okay? And the thing about singing is we want to make sure that we are heartfelt, all right? We're not shouting just to shout. I already talked about the illustration of people shouting at the wrong place, but we want to, with our singing, to be heartfelt, okay? And so there are some, some churches where... Uh, the song leader, every song, just sing it out, sing it out. They just want songs. I've heard preachers say, hey, just pick songs that are uplifting. You know, uh, we just want, we don't want the atmosphere to be, you know, slowed down where we're singing these slower songs or whatever. And I understand where they're going. There's certain times of the service where you want people to be awake and you want them to be singing. And so this is what they're talking about. But quite honestly, there are a lot of different types of songs that we can sing. And, and they're in the Bible too, not just a man-made uh, there are songs called Lamentations that are for mourning, right? Sorrowing. <clears throat> a lot of places we can go, but 2 Chronicles 35, 25 says, And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. This is when he passed away. And all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah in their lamentations to this day and made them an ordinance in Israel. And beheld, behold, they are written in the Lamentations. Lamentations were songs or poems that were recited and given in a in a manner that was uh, mourning and sorrowful, and there are songs in our songbook that the 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 words to the song are songs that would be of a more sorrowful nature, and it wouldn't really make sense. It's not really heartfelt if you're singing it to a totally different tune or an emotion than it was than it was meant to meant to be sung, and so we don't sing loud just because that's what we're supposed to do because we're Baptists. We want to sing, we want to be heartfelt, okay? There are battle songs. You know, uh, what's a good battle uh, battle song in our songbook? Sound the, battle sound the battle cry. That's a good one. Hold the fort. Hold the fort for I am coming. Or how does it sound the battle cry? Sound the battle cry. See, these songs are emoting a, 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 a feeling that we want to be in agreement. We want to be heartfelt. We want to sing it like we mean it. And so this is, uh, uh, this is the nature of songs. There are songs, obviously, that are happy songs. Psalm 100, verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. There are some songs that are supposed to be happy. We don't go around singing, I'm so happy, here's the reason why Jesus took my burdens all away. <laughs> That's not heartfelt. You want to sing heartfelt. If it's a joyful song, you're singing joyfully. You got to get your heart in the right spirit, uh, in, the, in the right emotions that you need for the song, okay? And then there are songs that are to be sung loud, okay? And, and, and the Bible talks about loud songs. And the children, this is 2 Chronicles 30, 31. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. <laughs> I've always wondered, you know how sometimes there will be that neighbor 
that will just be playing their music like super loud. And you're always like, man, I want to play some good Christian music, just blast it out real loud or whatever. Or sometimes uh, in, in Iola, Iola's a small enough town, and in the city square they have a, a place where people meet together. Sometimes they'll have bands or orchestras or sometimes somebody even with electric guitars or whatever and drums. And you're trying to sleep at night. Now there's a curfew. You can only go to a certain time. But they'll be on the square performing some kind of thing, and you can just hear <laughs> I've always thought, man, I want, and I want to do this sometimes, seriously. We've got a property there across the parking lot. There's like a grassy field. I don't know if you know where I'm talking about. If you're looking out the main doors in Iola, there's a parking lot, and then there's a, uh, yeah, there's like a, there's a road, and then there's a parking lot, and then there's a grassy field. And I've always wanted to put a big tent on that grassy field and have like a tent revival, right? And have people coming out singing and just like blaring that mu that music so that the whole town can hear the music. Not not ungodly music. I'm talking about good godly music. Loud instruments, though. And people up there singing and then the preaching, somebody preaching, the whole neighborhood hears it. I want to get compliance in the mail, uh, e nasty emails about, hey, you need to turn your music down. Be like, hey, you need to turn your music down. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> there are a case for loud singing, okay? It's a time of celebration and a time, hey, we want people to hear uh, about our God. But I believe that variety is good. Right is good. Music, I, I'm, I've probably shared this with you before. Music, the, the word muse is in music. Okay, Muse means to like think about something. And if you think about it, like music should be something that we stop and we think about where it has meaning to it. And this is why I, I'm bothered by the type of music that's just all emotion. And after that, hey, what were you singing about? I have no idea. It was just an emotional song. I like the tempo. I like the beat. I like the way that that sounded. A lot of contemporary music's that way. Uh, you don't really know what you were singing about. You just know I like that song because I like the way that the feeling that was. <laughs> but we uh, variety is good because it keeps us thinking. You know, hey, this song is a sad song. We're singing it in a in a, in a, a softer way. You know, with the different dynamic than we are with these happy songs or these battle type songs. Okay, and some songs can even be spoken. There's a lot of songs in the Bible. You don't have to turn there, but Deuteronomy 31 talks about Moses speaking a song. And a lot of the Psalms, you know, I think, I don't know this for sure that nobody knows what it sounded like, but I think a lot of the Psalms were probably just spoken. Maybe there was music playing in the background, but they were just recited. I know a lot of Lamentations were like that as well. And so we don't do that that much unless, unless you count rap. Uh, songs, uh, songs. <laughs> is, is a rap, is is rap considered a song? I don't even know what they call it. Rap song. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway. Have you heard? Uh, there are. It's kind of like a trend though in a lot of the contemporary type churches where they'll uh, somebody will get up there and you have like this lady preacher and she'll just be like like rapping, you know the gospel or something like that anyway. It's crazy, it's crazy. But uh, some songs can be spoken. Not, I'm not talking about rap, okay? But uh, they can be spoken. So I hope you understand what I'm talking about. Look, it's, there's a time to get loud, but we don't get loud just to put on a show where the people will look at us. Uh, we, you know, there's a time to preach loud, but we don't do it just like, you know, thinking, hey, everybody will think I'm a great preacher if I preach loud. We do it because we have a message to tell. We want to be understood. Right? We don't amen the preaching to be seen of men, but we do it because we want to let everybody know we're in agreement. We want to be a help to the service, edify our brothers and sisters in Christ and say, hey, we're in agreement. Don't you agree with this? Amen. Wasn't that a good point? And we want them to know that. And in our singing, we want to be heartfelt. We don't get loud just because we're supposed to get loud. We get loud when we're supposed to get loud. And we get softer when we're supposed to get softer. And that is a job of the song leader to kind of help uh, to emote that and get that sense in the uh, congregation as they sing. So I hope you understand why there are shouting Baptist churches. Some reasons not to always be con considered a shouting Baptist church. And then some reasons that we should uh, not fear being called a shouting Baptist church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for all you've done for us. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Iowa Baptist Temple. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us uh, to be sincere in our desires to serve you, that we'll be real in uh, in the offerings that we give to you, uh, the offerings of our of our singing, or just whether we're amening in the service, uh, 
All these things we do with our heart to bring honor and glory to you and be edifying uh, to the church. I pray, Lord, that you'll receive that and, uh, and you'll help us to grow, help us this coming year uh, to see great things happen that only you can get the credit and the honor and glory for. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.